Hey you folks, Quill18 here and welcome to the launch video for the Patreon funded Project Porcupine. Project Porcupine is the code name for a full set of tutorials on how to make a base building game like the super popular RimWorld or Prison Architect or Dwarf Fortress. The twist for us is that we are going to be building a star base, a space station. We are going to be building in space and that's going to have certain implication for um, our, our design from a gameplay point of view but also a programming point of view. And it's going to be really interesting to look into that. So one of the things with the programming channel Quill18 creates here is there's always been a conflict between this channel and my primary channel, my gaming channel, just youtube.com slash quill18, because I am a full-time YouTuber, and to pay the bills, I have to make sure to make the content that will allow me to do that as easily as possible. And the problem with the programming tutorials is that they take two to four times as long to make, and they really get a fraction of the views. But um, And so from a business point of view, it doesn't make as much sense to put as much time into those as my gaming channel. But I really enjoy making programming tutorials, and I think they have a lot of value. I think a lot of people get a lot of benefit from them. So uh, it's really come around to the thought that the way to make this work properly is to get a Patreon campaign to fund more game programming tutorials so that we can keep having that moving forward. So my goal will be to uh, get a consistent set of two tutorial videos every single week. I'm looking to release on Tuesday and Thursday right now, and those dates might change as we go forward and we start to talk with uh, the viewers and the Patreon supporters. And, and see what dates might work better. But that is the base goal. Guarantee for sure two programming tutorials every single week. And if we hit certain other milestone goals, then maybe a live stream every single month, for example, that would be amazing. So, you know, a two to maybe four hour live stream, depending on how things go and what time we might want to do it. Um, maybe a, so a, a consistent monthly live stream so we can get a lot more interaction, answer a lot more questions live. I'm really hoping that <clears throat> this project interests people and that uh, we can get your support to do this because I really want some consistent programming tutorials and I think people would like it as well. So hopefully we can make this work out. I do already have like a dozen videos set up ahead of time. So I've already got things kickstarted with a whole bunch of content and a whole bunch of videos are going to be coming your way in the uh, the coming weeks. And hopefully by the time we, we start to run out of those pre-made videos, we've got a good sort of kickstarted Patreon campaign over here and that we can keep making this game together. I have at this point a lovely slideshow. Sit back and relax for some fun when we talk about Project Porcupine. So a few years ago, I actually had the idea that our community should work together to build a game because we had a lot of gamers in the community. Um, and I don't, this may have even been before my programming channel. I can't remember exactly, but we also had a lot of programmers and it was a terrible, terrible idea. Didn't work at all. And I think the fault was mostly because of the design by committee. I set up a forum so that people could talk about all their ideas that they wanted to include in the game. And everyone has ideas is the good and the bad to that. And it wasn't really, despite the graphic, that the ideas were bad. It was that there were so many of them and a lot of them were contradictory. You can't do all the things. You can't have a game that is all the things to everyone. Um, and so it sort of fell apart there. So what's the problem? So um, there is in the open source world, the concept of the cathedral model of game design or of, of programming, which is your standard sort of programming model, where um, you have managers at the top that tell the programmers down the line what should be made, you know, so the word comes down on high. And then there's the bizarre model where there's just sort of this marketplace and everyone just shows up and sets up a stall and everyone sort of just happens to work together and gets things done. The bizarre model actually does work very well when scope is limited and there's a clear goal. And a great example with that would be um, all these like Unix command line tools, a command line tool that just supposed to do one thing but do it very 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 well so there's a limited scope and a clear goal and then it's all these people sort of um writing and improving little algorithms to tweak things to make it better and better and better and better but everyone knows what the thing is supposed to look like at the end and those things are not true in the early days of game development there's you can take a game in a million different directions just saying a base building game in space really doesn't tell you much about the actual implementations. Um, I, I have a series of videos that are coming up where we look at a variety of tile-based base building games, and you can see in there, even though they're all on the ground or, or involve, you know, digging into mountains, for example, they still solve a variety of problems in a variety of different ways, plus, of course, have very strongly differing themes as well. So um, that made it really, really difficult 
for uh, for the game design phase, especially early on before we got anything started. So as it turns out, I, I've, I've realized by doing some research that in practice, open source code doesn't necessarily mean communal development. Most or maybe all of the great, especially larger scale open source projects that I can think of have an official dev team. And those people are responsible for the core development of the game. Um, th something like uh, Dungeon Crawl Stone Soup, for example, something like uh, NetHack, but even uh, a lot of uh, software. For example, I did this software in LibreOffice. And yes, it's or I did the presentation in LibreOffice. It is a open source project and people can contribute, but there's still sort of a centralized dev team that handles the bulk of the work and certainly the bulk of the planning. Now there's still lots of room for outside contribution, bug reports which are very valuable, and then focused patches both to deal with a bug report or to add a specific feature or change way a specific feature works or to make a specific feature work better. People still contribute patches um, to, to make those changes and those will get folded into the main project um, if the official dev team approves them, for example. And there's a lot of room for making improved graphics and tile sets, especially in open source games. We see that a lot, that sort of modding, uh, the ability to design new monsters and items providing flavor text. Even if you're not a programmer, you can stat things out, you can describe things, and, and those creative ideas can get, then get folded into the game, for example. This is a good, uh, you see this all the time in roguelike game developments, for example. And then the true beauty of open source is if something really isn't working, if there's a disaster with the dev team, you can always just fork the project and start your own version. We have seen that time and time again with a lot of different software. Hey, for example, this library office that I am working in here is actually a fork of star office. And actually it's got a way bigger, more complex uh, sort of history than that. Uh, this happens also with roguelikes. For example, NetHack, which is a beautiful, wonderful roguelike, but tends to have very slow development uh, by the official dev team uh, with very infrequent releases, especially these days. So people have forked NetHack and come up with their own version. Slashim is a, is a great version of that, a great, uh, a great example of that, I should say. So you never have to worry about this software um, just getting completely stale. Someone can always take up the project and set up effectively a new dev team, uh, which again, I think is very important. So the plan this time is I'm going to res resurrect the name of Project Porcupine because I like the name. Someone suggested it in the forums, the idea of like a bunch of quills working together, right? Ah, lovely. So it's going to be a 2D tile-based base building game with a space station theme. It's going to be a single level, at least to start with. By that, I mean something like RimWorld and Prison Architect, for example. You just It's just like one level, one floor that you work on, as opposed to Dwarf Fortress, where you dig deeper into the mountain, um, and so you can go up and down different floors. However, I am going to be designing this in such a way that we can add more levels later on. At no point will the program make an assumption about things being single level, if at all possible. So if we decide that we want multiple floors to our starbase, uh, that's something that we can consider going forward. It will have a space station theme. Game inspirations, as I keep saying, RimWorld, Dwarf Fortress, even Space Station 13 is going to be an inspiration. Space Station 13 is sort of a... Uh, role-playing multiplayer. I don't know how to describe Space Station 13, but we're going to take uh, certain inspirations out of that as well. And for media inspiration, stuff like Deep Space Nine, Firefly, The Honorverse, which is a great series of books, and The Martian. Both The Honorverse and The Martian, um, really a lot of their strong points is they have sort of a strong science. Honorverse is sci-fi, but a, a hard sci-fi, where they set certain rules and then they sort of stick to it. And they don't try to make too many things up after the fact. And I really think that adds a lot of depth and realism to the world. It feels more concrete. And so we might um, borrow the idea of trying to go slightly more realistic, for example, um, in making sort of oxygen and atmosphere work properly in the space station. Actually, with that, we might uh, take inspiration from certain Kerbal Space Program mods that add some really hardcore life support into the game, which is really interesting. But again, to avoid falling into the trap of last time, I'm going to start the project entirely on my own. I'm going to set up a phase one feature list and be responsible for implementing most of all of it. That's really what the, the first, um, I don't know, couple dozen tutorial videos are going to be. We're going to get a baseline game established with a certain structure and certain assumptions about how things will work. Now, those things may change down the road. In fact, I expect a lot of things to change down the road. But it'll set up a base that we can use as a foundation for discussion about further features. So I am hoping to get in more user input from outside, but I want to start things off relatively strong and stable and, and have a clear direction so that we have a context for further uh, 
discussion. So here's the phase one sort of general outline, which is also going to more or less coincide with the first few videos. We're going to set up a 2D tile map system. I'm going to delve into my web application design background and implement a strong separation between the data model and the sort of view side of things. And so what I mean by that is um, all the game data and also most of the core logic of the gameplay is going to be in a series of classes that are not going to be derived from the Unity mono behavior class. Yes, we are going to be developing this in Unity, but the, the actual logic stuff isn't going to be developed from mono behavior. It's never going to be attached to a game object. In fact, none of the game logic code is even going to be aware of things like game objects. And really, it would not be difficult to port it out of Unity and move it to a different game system completely, although it will be coded in C Sharp, so that does put certain restrictions on where you could move it to, but it won't be tied to Unity at all. And then as a separate layer will be the view rendering um, side of things, which is responsible for putting the visuals on the screen and also interacting with, you know, the mouse and keyboard and interacting with the user interface that way. And then sending the information back to the data model as, you know, the player says, hey, why don't you go and, um, you know, character A, why don't you go over here and do that? Well, it communicates it back to the data model to handle it. What's going to be interesting about this is I'm going to be developing the game in, you know, simple 2D tile systems, again, very similarly to RimWorld, Prison Architect, and Dwarf Fortress. But if someone wants to change it, if we later on want to change it to an isometric viewpoint or even 3D graphics, we are going to, because of the segregation, it's going to be possible to just change the view system to render in 3D without changing any of our game logic whatsoever. Hey, take that, Dwarf Fortress. Fortress. It's going to be a lot easier for us to separate one to the other. Um, our tile system will have very basic tile types. We're going to talk about this more once we start the work, but also when we, I got some videos that look at other 2D tile map based games and we look at how they implement certain things and that'll be relevant there. We're going to do some direct building where you click on the mouse and install some objects with a basic UI. Then instead of uh, objects being directly placed by the mouse, we're going to set up a job system where instead you queue up a job to be done. And then we have an AI character come around that grabs the job from the queue, walks to the spot, performs the work. Then we'll introduce pathfinding so that you don't just walk through walls, which is what our first character is going to do, but instead walks around walls using A star. Then we're going to introduce a object system. This We're going to have a little bit of object system over here, and I'm going to consider I'm going to have sort of two types of objects, the idea of an installed object. So a wall and a door, for example, these are not going to be tile types. The tile type itself is just going to be basically empty or floor, or maybe we'll have different types of floors later on. But there can be objects installed on top of floors, like walls and doors and beds and sofas and fabrication stations and uh, reactor engines, or I don't know what else, what else we'll come up with later on. And then there'll be loose objects, which is to say, you know, um, some metal panels that are sitting in a storage room ready to be used for building in the future. And some things can be stackable. Uh, for example, those, those the, you know, the metal the metal bars or whatever that we use for our crafting system. So we'll introduce it there. Uh, then we are going to use that object system as resources for construction. So now our characters will need to, um, rather than just go to the job site and complete it instantly, they'll have to go pick up the materials, haul that to the job site, and then go to work. And then what I want to do is, I think we're going to implement, and the further we go into phase one, the more likely it is to change. But I think we'll implement a sort of a room system where we can detect if an area is fully enclosed by walls and doors, and then it'll call that a room. And and then the room will do things like track its own air pressure, perhaps. Maybe there'll be ways to define a room to be a certain type of room. I'm not sure that's going to happen in general, other than maybe an airlock down the way over here. You can define a ro room to be an airlock, at which point the behavior of attached doors sort of changes because... Um, There'll be sort of automatic pressurization, depressurization as people enter and leave um, the room. And uh, with the atmosphere, I do want to have characters that breathe. You know, you have a sort of a small internal air reserve, your your lungs. But then maybe, again, walking through the airlock, maybe you put on a spacesuit, which has a bigger reserve. I don't know. We'll figure that out. And then, yeah, at some point, we have to put in the door animation. So instead of our characters being able to instantly walk through doors, we have to have the characters sort of walk up to the door, the door play an animation that it opens, the character steps through and the door closes behind. So the characters have to wait for the door to open. Sometimes the doors can be locked as well, um, especially if there's a problem with, say, an airlock, for example. We'll see. And then I've got a basic idea of what the future phases might look like. Uh, expanded resources, power generation, food, water, more accounting in sort of a realistic kind of way for oxygen, nitrogen, and uh, carbon dioxide. 
Maybe you can put in a mining drone launcher that sort of, you know, launches a mining drone that goes down to a planet, then comes back with building material, because where does the building material come from? Uh, maybe more standard of living objects, aeroponics or hydroponics to grow food, maybe have more food variety and have that be important, the ability to cook things maybe, beds, that would be nice, and then specialized fabrication. So up until now, we've probably been using raw metal for construction, but instead, maybe you should set up machining shops that convert the raw metal or the ore that the mining drone come. Uh, it returns with and convert that into metal sheets, ceramic blocks. That name is stolen from the Honorverse, transparent aluminum, which is stolen from Star, Star Trek, uh, and you know, fiber optic cables and things like that, right? So, and then jobs might also have categories at this point that we can introduce. And again, things like Dwarf Fortress and Rimworld have this explicitly where you can set different characters to have different jobs. Uh, something like Prison Architect has it, um, ha ha you can't set jobs for particular characters, but the character that you hire does certain things. For example, you hire workers and they're responsible for simply for construction, repairing, and some basic hauling. And then you hire security guards, which are there for fighting and also opening and closing doors. And you hire janitors, which are there simply for cleaning. So whether we have fixed careers or whether anyone can work any job, um, but you can assign them to it. And then later on, maybe they have skills uh, so that you know you prefer to have certain people working certain jobs. We'll see how that goes down the road. We'll, we'll figure out what we want. I think I like the idea of characters being able to theoretically do anything, um, but having varying skill levels in it. So you're still gonna wanna optimize who does what. And then maybe we can have docking ports, people can visit, people can trade, maybe col more colonists will arrive. Maybe there'll be space tourism, I don't know. At some point we'll want danger of some kind to come in here. We could start very simply with just sort of asteroids and space debris that can impact the station. Now you got to repair things, like things can become damaged and you got to worry about repairs. Um, different types of walls, maybe for defenses, maybe shielding systems, maybe automated laser, laser turrets that can shoot down some of the asteroids. And then that comes into proper enemies like space pirates that will try to engage your laser turrets and maybe will attempt to land on your docking port or even like sort of like breach one of your walls and then board your ship and then you have character based combat that is going to be way 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 down the line but those are the sort of plans i have in there and then i have a generic sort of definition page over here uh that may or may not be up to date you guys can pause if you want to read that um but yeah that is the general outline and again we are going to be funding this using patreon if this is an idea that you like uh please support the ongoing tutorial system again we're going to aim for two uh, episodes or an episode on Tuesday and Thursday, maybe even a live stream. And if there's a lot of support, we will simply add more and more and more episodes, more and more and more live streams. I have I have no idea where to even like start guessing where these things go. Um, other than I, I generally know how long it takes me to make one of these tutorial videos. Um, and so that sort of set the baseline funding level for making it a, a reasonable thing for me to spend basically uh, at least a half a day on each episode on and, you know, make that work. But really, really looking forward to this. And again, I already have about a dozen episodes uh, ready to go, um, including the episodes where we look at other tile-based games and try to dissect them and figure out how they work. And um, so look forward to that, and hopefully you'll, uh, you'll support things. Thanks for watching, folks. Spread the word. Even if you can't support it yourself, please spread the word to other programmers who might be interested in these sorts of tutorials. And um, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.